Welcome to Navigating Advocacy, the true crime podcast that goes beyond storytelling to ignite change and seek justice. I'm Melissa. And I'm Whitney. As true crime enthusiasts turned passionate advocates, we've seen the power of storytelling raise awareness about unsolved crimes and bring hope to victims and their families. We hope to inspire action and promote positive change within the true crime community. Our mission is simple. We provide a platform for victims and their families to share their stories, to be heard, and find solidarity. But we don't stop there. We offer practical guidance to our listeners on how they can actively make a difference in their own communities. In each episode, we'll discuss a different unsolved case. We'll examine the details, highlight potential leads, and strive to spark new interests that may help advance the investigation. Our goal is to reignite hope and ultimately bring justice where it's long overdue. But this podcast is about more than just a conversation. It's about building a community of like-minded individuals who share a common purpose, making a real difference in the fight for justice. Whether you're a seasoned true crime fan or new to the genre, we invite you to join us on this journey of discovery and advocacy. Together, we can create a wave of change. We're here to empower you to also become advocates for change, no matter where or who you are. We are navigating advocacy. We are ready to help you find your way. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. And for the first time in probably a year and a half, we're recording together. We are. It's so exciting. Thank you, TCPF. Yeah. We're bringing us together for a whole week, 10 days. And we have been so productive in this 10 days. We really have. I'm really proud of that. But <laughs> the highlight so far, because we haven't went to TCPF yet, um, is the Honkin Wave event we had, which was amazing. Yes. We went to Albuquerque. We met up with our good friend Eric and actually got to host an event, and it was amazing. We did a honk and wave for our upcoming action-oriented advocacy case that will be coming out towards the end of the month, beginning of October, right? Yes, it's going to come out. Technically, it's supposed to come out in September, but we are going to be ending season four, so we wanted to just put that in there between season four and season five. It is a, just a devastating case, and I hope you all listen into it. But we had a lot of people show up to our Humpkin Way. Awesome event. One of the biggest things that we had people asking us about with the Honkin Wave, not just, out, I mean, outside of the event itself, was our shirts. Again. We have Barbie-inspired shirt. They're on our website now, so go get them. Because yeah. Advocate Barbie can be whoever they want to be. And there's new merch on there as well, new branding, you know, all of that. Stuff. We're fighting with that, all that done as well. Yep. And if you use code free ship, you can get free shipping. Okay. So today's case in Virginia, correct? Virginia. Let's get into it here. <clears throat> Virginia is a state known for its rich American history. It's the birthplace of the nation, the mother of president and was the state of the first English settlement in Jamestown. Four of the first five presidents of the United States were born there, and Virginia was originally inhabited by several indigenous tribes, including the Algonquin, Nadia, and Meharan tribes. Old world diseases diminished the indigenous population quickly, along with colonization, putting strain on natural resources, causing over 75% of the tribal population to perish. In the mid-1800s, the capital city of Richmond was the capital of the Confederacy as well before it fell. We are navigating 200 miles west of Richmond to a vibrant town called Blacksburg, Virginia. Blacksburg is perhaps best known as the home for Virginia Tech, a prominent university with a strong focus on research and education. It offers over 280 different degree programs and has a prominent sports presence. When I think of Virginia Tech, I'm taken back to my own college years when the 2007 mass shooting occurred. April 16, 2007, a student opened fire and fatally shot 32 faculty members and students. 
At the time, it was the deadliest mass shooting committed by a lone gunman in history. NeighborhoodScout.com lists Blackburg as a community that is safer than 49% of similar municipalities. Woohoo! Oh, finally, we get one that's not in the single digits. Yes. The chance of becoming a victim of a violent crime is 1 in 999. Not what I would consider as a violent crime, but according to Virginia Code 18.2-57, it is considered a misdemeanor to tickle women or other persons against their will. I kind of love that. I hate being tickled again. Some say that this law is why the state saying is Virginia is for lovers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Heidi Childs and David Metzler were just that, lovers. After knowing each other for many years, having attended and participated in the same church youth group in nearby Lynchburg, Virginia. Before college, Heidi was mainly homeschooled and loved all things outdoorsy. She was the fourth of eight children and spent much of her free time hiking, skiing, camping, and always with friends. She played basketball for her church team and was musically inclined. She could play the guitar and sing, but she didn't like the spotlight to be on her. Heidi was an honor roll student and earned a full academic scholarship to Virginia Tech. Having taken many dual credit classes since she was a sophomore in high school, the 18-year-old was able to enroll in college with several hours already under her belt. Heidi was majoring in biochemistry and excited for her future. Wow, biochemistry. That sounds difficult. David was equally as ambitious as Heidi. Having moved to the Lynchburg area after serving as missionaries in China, David's family settled into the community. David's father was a medical doctor in town, and David loved to play golf, soccer, guitar, and spending time with his family. He was considered a homebody. The 19-year-old had been accepted into the College of Engineering and was planning to major in Industrial and Systems Engineering. Holy crap! Smart fuggies. Yes, I love their addition. The two worked at an ice cream shop together and eventually began dating after high school. Their family said they were inseparable and made a great team together. The two were strong in their faith and shared that with others. Just two days after the start of her sophomore year at Virginia Tech on August 26, 2009, Heidi had made the major decision to enroll in a pre-med program changing her major. She called her parents giddy with excitement and wanting their opinions before her scheduled meeting with her advisor on the following day to finalize the change. That evening, David wanted to take Heidi out to a camping area that he had been to approximately 15 miles away from campus. He had told his roommate that this was going to be a special date, maybe to celebrate Heidi's decision to change her major or just to spend quality time one-on-one -on -one with Heidi. David had been out to Caldwell Fields Campgrounds in Jefferson National Forest for a men's retreat and wanted to take Heidi there. He asked her to wear comfortable clothes and to bring her guitar. He wanted to sit out in nature and talk and play the guitar. This campground is just off of Craig Creek Road and is essentially a rocked parking area. Hikers, tourists, college students, and locals are all familiar with this popular spot. There are mountains, forests, and quiet all around. Cell phone reception is spotty, and perhaps that's one of its allures. The two got into David's 1992 Toyota Camry and headed to the campgrounds before 8.30 that evening. The two both had early starts the following day and did not plan to stay out late. But the couple would never make it home that evening. A man was out locking his dog at Caldwell Field at 8 a.m. the following day when he came upon the couple's Toyota. In the driver's seat, he found David had been murdered. Heidi was then found on the ground on the passenger side of the vehicle just a few feet away. David had been shot through the driver's side window, and it appeared as though Heidi was attempting to run away since she was outside of the vehicle just a few feet away and also shot with the same weapon. This sounds like something out of the 70s. This type of thing happened quite a bit back mm -hmm. in the day with serial killers randomly killing young couples. Yeah, that part. Lover lane, lover's lane type murders. It? And for this to be 2007, it is weird. 2009. 2009, it's weird. Mm-hmm. 
initial investigations are tight-lipped. On September 1st, 2009, law enforcement put out a plea asking for help that plea for help asking that anyone in the vicinity of the campgrounds or the shooting range roughly eight miles away between the hours of 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. to contact police. They believed the two had been murdered between 8 p.m. and 10 p.m. I'm not sure what brought them to this revelation, maybe time of death uh, after autopsies, but possibly they knew what time they were going to leave. Maybe they had an RA system where they were supposed to be back by 10, 1 o'clock, but they knew that if the kids were going to leave there by 10, that they had to have been shot before then. Could have been. A search warrant was issued on David's car, and only three items were listed as being found. A hair, a sweatshirt, and the car itself. What? No further description. Well, first of all, can you count the car itself as an item that you found in the car? Well, it's possible that they only listed it as to not give away what evidence they may have found. It, something could have been found within the vicinity of the car. And they're just saying, oh, this is what we found. Yay. That's true. To keep, and to keep the evidence with them. So that means they keep the car with them for, for this or that reason. Gotcha. And so that it's not getting just sitting in an impound lot or then it gets sold off to the crusher or released as not being evidence anymore. Oh. They may have just used it to hold on to. That makes sense. That same day, David and Heidi's funeral were held together. And over 1,000 friends, family, and students were in attendance. Their caskets sat side by side, David's a dark brown wood and Heidi's light pink. Everyone who knew the two thought that they were going to get married in the future and their families buried them side by side. There are many discussions around why little to no information was released. Some say that because of the mass shooting that happened two years prior, another gun-related crime could cause major turmoil within the community. The first press conference held for Heidi and David was in March of 2012. Holy crap. This is when law enforcement announced that they had assembled a task force to investigate. They released to the public that the weapon used was a 30-30 caliber hunting rifle that is a common gun used to hunt deer. They further announced that they had DNA that they suspected came from the killer. This was also the first mention of what was taken from the couple. Heidi's purse was not found. Inside of her purse was a silver Nibirola razor phone, a silver Sony Cybershot camera, her university ID card, Virginia Tech lanyard, and a credit card. The guitar remained inside the vehicle. So was robbery the motive? It just seems a weird place way out in the middle of nowhere to, like, just try to rob someone. But it's frequented by college students. If you're if you're targeting college students because you think they're an easy true robbery and they're out there where there's no cell phone service, they can't call for help in the event of a act of that, that's the actual motive. That's true. It seems, like, I guess it could be like a robbery crime of opportunity type of thing. And then you sure. just had to kill them. Mm-hmm. That seems. I don't know. What I held on to was this is literally the inside of my purse when I was a college kid. Mm-hmm. I had a I- college ID card, had a college lanyard, had a Sony Cybershot camera. Because then your cell phone didn't have a camera. That's true. You carried a separate camera with you. Investigators still have not released what they believe happened. They did, however, receive several leads pointing to six vehicles that may have been in the area. A green sedan, possibly a Ford Taurus or Dodge Intrepid, was seen stopping in front of residences on Frag Freak Road around 6 p.m. A dark fluve Dodge Caravan was seen parked near the border of Montgomery and Frag Counties near a logging site around 8.30 p.m. A dark-colored van or minivan was parked at Caldwell Fields after dark. Mm -hmm. A dark-colored Ford Crown Victoria or Chevrolet Caprice was seen driving on Frag Creek Road around 10 p.m. Now, Crown Vicks are usually police vehicles. So, that's an interesting one. A red or red and white Dodge extended cab pickup with dual exhaust 
oversized tires, and tinted windows, was seen driving up Lee Road about 11 p.m., which is directly across from Caldwell Field. So, had the teens been murdered before 10 p.m., these people would have seen it. These last two people would have seen it. Definitely. Could have seen it. Not would have. Could have. Maybe they don't pay attention. A gray or cream-colored early 2000s model Pontiac Bonneville parked near Caldwell Fields around midnight was also seen. I wonder if these all came from late date end of like different mm-hmm. cars. They, they, not as many people had green cameras or green. It's out in the middle of nowhere. There's not a ton of residences mm-hmm. out there because it's the National Forest. Yeah, but I thought you said it was driving by some of the houses. One of them was driving okay. by a house. So... I don't, I'm assuming that someone is just standing outside and saw it. That had to have been witness statement. So this is way out there. Who is witnessing all of these cars in this area, but not witnessing the murder? Exactly. And it's, when you look at it on a map, there's a, there's a paved road and then you turn off of the paved road into the little parking area that is rock. Okay. And then directly across from it is a dirt road. That's Lee Road. That is a gravel road. Okay. So it's not. And it's 15 miles from this college campus. It's not super far out there in the middle of nowhere. It's not like when we're in Colorado and we go to the cabin and it's like way out in the middle. Like it's hard to stumble upon, essentially. But it's where people frequent. Every, everyone drives past that road. Okay. So it could have been literally anyone calling in with a tip. Gotcha. In 2019, a second press conference was held still seeking answers in Heidi and David's murder. They also announced a $100,000 reward for information leading to an arrest after the FBI donated $28,000. And I have, how do you determine the amount of money that the FBI is going to donate? If it's, it's 28 seems like a very strange number. Agreed. And how do they determine who are they going to donate it to? Like, why does this family deserve it more than this family type of thing? So that bugs my mind, but $100,000 is. So much money for well, it's probably one of the highest news. Yeah, absolutely. And for a not very high profile case, yes. this is one that I had not heard of before. Agreed. And I know that you hadn't heard of it before. Oh. I just to have that much monetary presence, essentially. Yeah. Maybe they needed that to try to like give the case a boot. I mean, and it seems like, I mean, the dad, the doctor. Mm. So maybe they kind of just like pulled all their resources together to get the done and i know that the general community was really in shock about it so mm-hmm. there was some media coverage not much but it was j- since then since the anniversaries have come around now there's been many that have come forward with you know like with con- their concerns why hasn't this been solved why isn't more people talking about it that kind of stuff yeah it it's crazy that 14 years later heidi and david's murderer remains unknown if you have any information about Heidi, David, their murderer, or any of the cars of interest, please contact the Virginia State Police at 540-375-9589. Just by listening to our content, you too are advocating for justice for these families. Thank you for making a difference in their lives as well. We want to share a few ways you can support us to continue our mission. You can become a Patreon subscriber for as little as $5 per month or a simple rate and review on your favorite podcast platform helps us get in front of someone who may know something. We will continue to shed a light on the forgotten victims, untangle the webs of deceit, and examine the eerie coincidences that make these cases so compelling. We believe that working together can affect change and create a world where victims are heard, justice is served, and communities are empowered to make a difference, no matter where or who they are.